Welcome back to the podcast where we're going through the book of Genesis together. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different, uh, probably a little bit shorter than some of the other ones have been. Today's episode is from Genesis chapter 10, and what this entire chapter is is the nations or the descendants of Noah. It's a, it's a long list of names. I could read it, uh, but you would hear me really struggle to pronounce quite a few of these names, so to save you from, uh, from having to listen to me do that, I'm not going to read all of the chapter like we usually do, but I do want to read a few verses in this chapter, and then I've got a few notes, a few thoughts from this to kind of help continue to guide us along the path that Genesis is taking us on. But in Genesis chapter 10, it opens up with, in verse 1, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the sons were born to them after the flood. And then it goes through, here are the sons of Japheth, and then here are his grandsons, and their sons, and their sons. And it says in chapter 10, verse 5, from these, specifically from Japheth, from these the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. And then it mentions in verse 6, the sons of Ham. You also read about in uh, chapter 10, verse 8, one of Ham's sons named Cush had a son named Nimrod, and it says he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom, one of them was a city named Babel in the land of Shinar. And from that land, he went to Assyria. He built Nineveh and other cities as well. Very prominent and important cities in the biblical narrative. Nimrod is connected to them. Nimrod's a descendant of Ham. You also read about the Canaanites and people who lived in the area where the children of Israel would eventually, God would bring them out of Egyptian captivity, and they would eventually end up, you have descendants of Ham there in that area, the families of the Canaanites. These were, chapter 10, verse 20, the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands and in their nations. And then you have the descendants of Shem. And the people that were descended from him, the various nations from him. And it says, uh, chapter 10, verse 30, And their dwelling place was from Mesha as you go towards Sephar, the mountain of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Now, Genesis chapter 11 is going to really explain to us how all of these nations came to be. How did, where did all these different languages and nations, where did it all come from? Genesis chapter 11 really explains how this happens. Chapter 10 is sort of a, a zoomed out big picture view of here are the nations, here are the, the peoples who came from each of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, a couple of lessons from this chapter, from Genesis chapter 10, a couple of things that I think is important for us to think about. First of all, God, and we're going to see this more again in the beginning of chapter 11, God was involved in the spread and the growth of the nations. By allowing the growth and the spread of such powerful cities and kingdoms on this earth, the power of God's kingdom is going to be completely and thoroughly demonstrated. Uh, for example, in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 through verse 45, in a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar had had, Daniel is given an interpretation of that from God, and it says, In the days of these kings, of these powerful kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms, the kingdoms of men that have been mentioned, and it's it, God's kingdom, shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces... The iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the other kingdoms that had been mentioned, 
The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. God allows the nations to grow powerful as an arena of sorts to showcase how his power is superior to the power of man. So God allows, God is involved in the spread and the growth of the nations, and God allows some of the kingdoms of men to grow, at least as far as our standards go, very powerful. And what we're going to see as we go through Scripture, the reason for that is so that God's power could be demonstrated as being superior to, greater than, even the most powerful kingdoms of men. So we see that. God was involved, and part of the reason he was involved was so that he could show his glory, his majesty, his power over all of the glory and majesty and power of the kingdoms of men. Another lesson, and really this is our final lesson from Genesis chapter 10, we also see from this chapter that God knows the end of from the beginning. Isaiah writes about this in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 8 through 11. He knows the end from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 through 11, we read about the establishment of cities like Babylon and Nineveh. These are going to play a role later to humble God's people, to bring God's judgment upon them for their sin, but also then after they serve these cities serve their role to bring God's judgment and to humble God's people God then would humble those cities the cities and the nations of Babylon and Nineveh which would be known as Assyria and this is all the more it's it just shows that something that is repeated in Daniel chapter 4 verse 37 God humbles those who walk in pride. Nebuchadnezzar himself says this. He says, I know, I praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. As powerful as King Nebuchadnezzar, king over Babylon was, he was raised up as ruler for a very brief time by God, And God, Nebuchadnezzar, came to realize, one of the few rulers of this world who came to realize it in his life, Nebuchadnezzar realized that just as quickly as God had raised him to power, God could just as quickly remove him from power. God was involved in the spread and the growth of the nations, in part to demonstrate his power, but also we see here all the way back in Genesis, the starting of kingdoms, of nations, of cities, who would play a very important role down the road in the, in the lives of God's people. We're reminded that God knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, verse 8 through 11. And so no doubt there are probably some other lessons that we could notice from Genesis chapter 10. If there's something that you've thought of in your studies, feel free to comment and drop that thought here. Uh, But I hope our study of Genesis chapter 10, this brief look at Genesis 10, has been helpful to you. Lord willing, next time we'll dive into Genesis chapter 11, and we'll think about the significance of the Tower of Babel and what that lesson, that, that event, is pointing us forward to. So I appreciate you studying along with me, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.